Today we travel back in time quite a bit from our recent stories. We're going back to an incredible story covered briefly in our episodes about Colonial Virginia. Thanks go out, by the way, to Reason Magazine's Jesse Walker for letting me know about the most amazing new book on early Virginia, The Wreck of the Sea Venture in Bermuda, and the man who perhaps should be better known as the real, true founding father of America, a humble minister's clerk named Stephen Hopkins. Professor Joseph Kelly joins me now to talk about his book, Marooned, Jamestown, Shipwreck, and a New History of America's Origin. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So I'd, I'd like to approach this interview sort of as the story of Stephen Hopkins, uh, the guy that I now at least like to think of as America's real true founding father. Tell us about Stephen Hopkins. Uh, well, Stephen Hopkins is, you know, as, as, as you mentioned, kind of an unlikely hero. You know, he's not a university educated person, certainly did not go to the ends of courts and that kind of thing. We don't know a ton about him, just as we don't know a ton about uh, anyone who is really a commoner in England at the time. There's the records that we have, of, of course, are the kind of things that that remain are going to be birth records, death certificates, uh, inheritance things. Uh, anytime he comes into contact with court, you know, we get a little bit of information about him. And then there's the narratives, you know, so there's just a little bit in the, uh, you know, about 600 words really uh, directly about Stephen Hopkins and the true reportery by William Strachey. But within that 600 words is, is just, you know, there's a powerhouse of information about him there. So we don't know a whole lot about his personal life. He grew up, uh, you know, uh, near Winchester. His, his dad was a yeoman farmer. Uh, he probably got a little bit of education. He might have been the reader of, of the Psalter in the Church of England, you know, local parish. So he might have been kind of very low level church official, which may be one of the reasons that contributed to him to going to Jamestown in the first place. He, he might have been, uh, you know, uh, aiding uh, Reverend Hunt, who was the, you know, the, the official uh, minister that went along with the uh uh, the third supply in 1609. Uh, but even that's kind of speculation. There's one biography that was written about him uh, by a guy named Caleb J Johnson, who has pretty much made Stephen Hopkins his, his life study. And uh, that book is, is a wealth, you know, he weaves together a pretty good story out of, out of these little bits of information that we have about Stephen. Um, but a lot of that book is you know, sort of filling in, you know, this is what life was like in this village in in the late 16th century and that kind of thing. So ultimately, you know, there's just not a whole lot of information. You know, it, I, I made the comparison. We know about it, as much about him as we know about Shakespeare, which is to say not a whole lot. Uh, uh, so it, it, it's been pieced together. But remarkably, he's been neglected. I mean, there, I, I, what we should have is, is, is a lot of people's studying the, the little bit of information we have about Stephen Hopkins, and hopefully this book will help kind of trigger people to do that, because um, they, haven't, they haven't done it in the past, and, and I certainly think he's one of the most important neglected figures in American history. Now, can you tell us, how would somebody like Hopkins have gotten caught up with something like the Virginia Company, and how, the, how did this guy find himself in Bermuda? Well, the... Uh, you know, the Virginia Company, after you know, the first two years of, of Jamestown were, were something of a disaster, and the Virginia Company knew this, and they, uh, you know, they're getting regular reports from Captain Newport, who has, has been back and forth several times. Uh, when he's in Jamestown, he's pretty much in charge, but when he leaves Jamestown, there, there's always a, a power struggle. The last time he came back to England, he carried with him a letter from John Smith, which just excoriated company policy and company officers over there in Virginia. So they knew things were going poorly. And what, what they did in the fall and the early spring, fall of 1608 and early spring of 1609, was completely reconceived how they were going to do things. They, they were going to ramp things up considerably. I mean, they really hoped to send 800 to 1,000 settlers in, in the third resupply of Jamestown. It didn't end up being that much, but it was still – 
a pretty significant uh, increase. About 500 settlers probably were were in a, among a fleet of uh, seven to nine ships, depending on how how what how big a ship needs to be to to be counted as a ship. Nine vessels went. Um, but for that effort, there, there was a gigantic propaganda effort uh, beginning in spring of 1609 to recruit people uh, and, and also to recruit dollars. I mean, they, they sent out circulars uh, all across England, all throughout London, all the various uh, uh, tradesmen's guilds had meetings about how much money that they were going to pool together to, to buy shares in the company. So it was just an amazing media blitz. Uh, you know, the equivalent today would be the savviest kind of social media slash, you know, TV advertisement. You know, of course, that kind of nothing equivalent to that kind of media existed, but but it was still just a tremendous effort um, through pamphlets, through um uh, sermons in churches through these guilds, as I said, to get the word out. So you, you would have to have been pretty, you know, kind of, uh, you know, checked out of things, especially if you're living in the south of England, which is kind of, you know, where the maritime activity was taking place to, to not be aware of what was going on. Um, now, with that said, I think it still took quite a bit of uh, courage for, for those 500 people to get on the ships and go. I mean, it was still basically going into terra incognita, but uh, but the media blitz, the propaganda certainly would have reached uh, somebody like Stephen Hopkins and, and, and given the hard sell, if you will, for the for what was going on in Virginia. Can we talk for a minute about the different types of consent that you mention throughout the yeah. book? There are all these different people signing up from different social strata essentially agree right. to different types of, of colonization, uh, and it yep. doesn't always work out. Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, one of those things that the information about this has been out there forever, and it has been strangely neglected by historians. So in the third supply, to, to take a look at that one in particular, so they, uh, the Virginia Company rewrote the charters. They were the original charters, which actually are several different documents, some by the king, some by the Virginia Company itself, and then other ordinances that are, that are established by the local colonial council in Jamestown. Uh, but they recognized that this uh, method of government wasn't really working. It, it was a, it was a council with a president, so they were going to establish a new form of government where you had a governor that basically had had uh, dictatorial powers. So they put together this charter, but they were still writing it and did not even have the king's approval for it as they were recruiting people. So you know, it's it's kind of an odd situation in which people are signing on to go on this um, you know this adventure without even having the document that was that was going to be the constitution governing them in place yet. Now, even with that said, they had a good idea of uh, the Virginia Company, the council had a, had a very good idea of what was going to be in that document. And they certainly expected it to get approved. So as they are signing people on, uh, they knew what what the uh, you know their uh, their recruits were were signing on to. The, the recruits themselves didn't have a great idea, but here's the particular thing that is really remarkable about the Virginia Company. You know, so it's based on the other uh, overseas trading companies, you know, the, the East India Company, the Muscovy Company, um, the Levant Company, that are groups of merchants who each buy shares in this joint stock company, and they pool their resources and also then pool the risk. What's different about this particular, what, about the Virginia Company, is that people can buy shares with their bodies. So you did not need to have money to buy a share in the company. Now, just in those other merchant companies, owning a share meant that theoretically, at least, you had a vote in the council. And this is what the, even the second charter said this. So theoretically, uh, each of the people who went on the ships to Jamestown in 1609, should have had, uh, you know, a, a, at least to some degree, a democratic voice in in the governance of the company. Now, in practice, that didn't work out because, uh, and this, this of course is something that the company officials were, were careful to do. I don't know if the king knew this or not. We, we don't have any evidence of whether he did or not. But uh, it, it seems to be the case of what they they wrote into the, their own provisions that you had to own two shares in the company. 
in order to have a vote on who was going to be a counselor. So essentially, you know, what was in the second charter itself, setting up kind of as a democracy was right from the beginning, getting undermined by the executives of the Virginia company itself. Because the only people who could have two, two shares in the company are people who are going to have the money to buy a share. And, and that was 10 pounds, 12 shillings. And, and most of the settlers, the, the common settlers are not going to have, be able to buy those shares. Now, the gentlemen who went on the ships, which is, you know, roughly 40, 50 percent of the people who are, who are going uh, to settle Virginia are able to buy shares. So those right from the beginning, you have two kind of classes of people who are heading to Virginia. You have the gentlemen who have a share because their physical body is going and they also uh, were able to buy one or more shares themselves. And in the company doc documents, we can see that they are given special status. It's, it's unlikely, uh, and, and again, we don't know, but it seems very unlikely from the circumstantial evidence, uh, it's unlikely that the common laborer who was going to Virginia recognized when they were signing on that there were two classes of people who were going. I mean, they knew gentlemen were going, but they didn't know that the gentlemen were gonna be a, a completely different class of people. Now, this is gonna have really great comp consequences after the shipwreck that uh, you know ends up depositing Stephen Hopkins in Bermuda. Uh, and also it's, al it's already had consequences for two years for people in, in Jamestown as well. And now let's also talk about the, the sort of obedience regime that comes along with being a member of these different classes. I mean, you mentioned that people with military experience, especially in a place like, uh, like Ireland, uh, they're well used to the kind of work regime and military discipline that they were going to find in Virginia. So, of course, they were sort of consenting to this. They were well used to it, but not somebody like Stephen Hopkins. Right. Uh, and, and again, this is uh, we're, we're speculating from circumstantial evidence, but, but our best guess is that people like Stephen Hopkins or any tradesperson or any of the people who didn't have any, any uh, trade skill and were just going as a common laborer, uh, they probably expected to encounter something similar to the plantations of Ireland, not not the garrisons that were in hostile terror territory in Ireland, but uh, plantations in Ireland where entire sections of the country had been depopulated of the native Irish and were getting planted by English. So, and, and in those cases, essentially, what would happen is that you know an entire town would get established, or you know a, a a cluster of farms, and and there would be, uh, you know, what would be established from the very get-go would be something that resembled typical uh, town life or or village life in England. Uh, so that's probably what they expected. They did not expect to be essentially uh, foot soldiers in a garrison. Um, but that's the, you know, that's the governing model that w was obtaining in Jamestown already, and that's certainly the governing model that was enshrined in the second charter that was written in uh, the spring of 1609. So when they stepped foot on the ships, uh, you know, in London or, or in Plymouth, uh, the settlers knew that they were putting themselves under the jurisdiction of the Virginia Company, but they did not really understand what that meant. Uh, they, they didn't understand, for instance, that to talk ill of the company could mean a death sentence if the governor thought it was warranted, and yet that's what it was. Uh, that's you know that that's the circumstances that they found themselves in. So they 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 felt that they were giving consent as as they uh, signed into this contract. Uh, what they were giving consent to, they they certainly didn't know. And and I I think it, it's really we can pretty well conclude from the evidence that we have that that the Virginia Company purposely kept them in the dark about that. Now, Hopkins goes aboard the ship, uh, the Sea Venture, along with the, the leader of the fleet and the uh, leader of the colony, who's you know, supposed to take over when he gets there. Um, they're sort of struggling for power and authority on the ship. Uh, at the same time, they're, they're making the trek across the Atlantic. Then what happens? Okay, so the, the, the Sea Venture is the flagship in this fleet. You know, they, they leave England with crowds cheering, banners flying. This is the biggest overseas plantation that England has ever mounted, you know, and, and this is England, you know, the, the English recognize this as their attempt to get into the empire game that, 
Spain and Portugal and even France uh, have already been playing. So this is, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. And, and this is the flagship. And it, the flagship is containing not only the second charter and all copies. I, ironic, I mean, this is just hard to believe, but every single copy of the second charter is on the flagship, as well as the new governor, uh, Thomas Gates, as well as the admiral of the fleet, uh, Admiral Summers. Now, the fleet sails into a hurricane. You know, I mean, you, you, you couldn't make these things up, right? This is truth stranger than fiction. All of the ships survive the hurricane except for the Sea Venture. And the other ships eventually limp into Jamestown and tell John Smith, who's, who's running the show in Jamestown, that he's basically been deposed. But they don't have the documents and they don't have the governor to prove it. So what immediately happens in Jamestown is, is a struggle for power. Now, what happens in, to, to the Sea Venture, you know, everybody in Jamestown thinks the Sea Venture is lost at sea. They think it's sunk. Uh, and it basically would have been. It, it was filling up with water slowly. They're struggling for three days and three nights and this, this uh, really difficult struggle against the storm. And at the last minute, when they decide to close up the hatches and consign themselves to, to the deep, they're, they're all going to drown and they're, they're, they're just kind of giving up. They sight land, uh, which is, seems miraculous. In the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, they, they sight land and they're managed to ram the ship on a reef about a half mile to a mile offshore and this is the bermuda islands which at, at the time were reputed to be devil's islands uh, completely uninhabited and incredibly dangerous to mariners because of the submerged reefs that are surrounding it so it's, it's a place that is generally avoided by sailors uh, but everybody gets ashore there's 153 people on board and all of them make it ashore as the waves are pounding the sea venture stuck stuck on this reef immediately there, there's two native americans among them machamps and the montauk who are uh, emissaries of uh wahoo sunacock uh, known as you know we know him as powhatan really in, in popular american culture uh they were they were emissaries to king james's court coming back and, and when they get ashore they immediately run off into the wilderness and are, and are not seen again until uh, you know, nine, ten months later, at least we don't have a record of them. Everybody else watches them disappear, and they uh, struggle ashore, get up to the high ground, make some huts, and and, and immediately are confronted then with with uh, what do you do next? Which which any shipwreck, anyone who suffers a shipwreck, has to go through, right? You go through the the, the immense struggle of the shipwreck and getting ashore, and then you're standing on on the sand, blinking at the sun, looking back around at everybody. You look, look at who else has survived. You look at the, the debris that has survived, the material debris that's coming up on shore. And the next order of business is how do you survive? What happened in, in Bermuda is re really remarkable. I mean, it's more uh, compelling than any, any of the survivor TV shows or you know, the, the, the fictional tales of shipwreck you, you can imagine. Uh, almost immediately, the rebellions start taking place. There's power struggles in Bermuda, just as there are in Jamestown. The first fissure happens between the governor and the admiral. And it doesn't take long. Pretty much once they realize that they're not going to get rescued, uh, the sailors and the admiral completely leave the camp, go to their own island, and set up their own camp. So we have rival camps. Uh, you know, within a couple months. The people, the settlers who remained in the governor's camp watched the sailors go, you know, disappear just as they watched the, the two Native Americans disappear into the wilderness. And almost immediately, the disgruntlement among those settlers sets in as well. So uh, the, the, the governor, uh, Governor Gates, he is intent you know, fiercely intent on getting to Jamestown because this is this is his big chance. This is his chance to make it big, to make a lot of money, to make a big splash. Is he's got to get to Jamestown to be governor, and he's really got a, a small window to be governor because he knows the fourth resupply is going to be is going to bring another governor. So, if he's going to get anything done, uh, you know, for his personal ambitions, he's going to have to get to Virginia as quickly as possible. So he immediately sets about building a ship. They have a shipwright who came with them and from the salvage of the sea venture and uh, 
from the cedars of Bermuda trees that they, they saw down and start hewing into lumber. He sets about building a ship that's going to bring them to, to Virginia. But he knows the ship is not going to be big enough, so he gathers everybody together and says, okay, some of you are going to be able to come with me, some of you are not going to be able to come with me, but everybody, you know, let's work on this ship together. Essentially what he does is he, he enters into a new contract with the settlers. The settlers themselves have been hearing stories now. You know, they, they, they signed on with all that propaganda back in England, right? Uh, they thought Virginia is going to be a wonderful place to get to. But as they're sailing, you know, before they got into the hurricane even, the sailors who have been to Jamestown are telling them what's really going on in Jamestown. And what's really going on is in the first summer, half the people died, you know. So Jamestown is a dystopia. It's not a utopia. And, and the settlers become disillusioned with their contract. So they be, begin to re, rethink the whole, the whole situation that they signed on to. They begin to realize what, in fact, the Virginia Company thinks their contract says and doesn't line up with they, what they think the contract says. So this is where people like Stephen Hopkins come to the fore. And what's remarkable about Hopkins is we have we actually have his words because you know all the narratives are are told to us through the executives of the Virginia Company. If you, you know, John Smith is an executive of the Virginia Company. The tale that we have of the shipwreck and what happens in Bermuda for 10 months as these people are, are, are cast away there, that comes to us through the words of William Strachey, who becomes a secretary of the governor. So he's an executive of the company as well. All of our narratives come from the, the official company line. But so... Uh, people like Stephen Hopkins are, are going to be the villains within these tales. Uh, but William Strachey telling the tale of Stephen Hopkins actually records some of his arguments. And so that's what, what makes Stephen Hopkins so exciting to us today, I think, is that we have actually his own words, uh, the kind of argument that he was making. So in Bermuda, as, as people are beginning to realize that what they're in for in Virginia is basically a slave labor camp. And most of them are probably going to die under the incompetent, backbiting leadership of the Virginia Company. What Stephen Hopkins begins to, to come to a realization of, or the argument he begins to make is that the Virginia Company contracted to bring them to Virginia, and, and they didn't fulfill their part of the bargain. And, and the language he says, the very fact of the shipwreck has ended their contract with the Virginia Company. It's as if you know, the, the, the salt water that they encounter in the shipwreck dissolved the, the contract itself. So what that made the settlers in Bermuda is essentially made them political free agents. And, and he doesn't use that term, of course, but this is exactly what Stephen Hopkins is arguing. We here in Bermuda have the ability to, or have the, um, uh, the right the right to decide for ourselves what what we are going to do we can we, we are bound to the governance of no man is is what he says and basically what he's saying is we don't have to do what the governor what governor gates is telling us to do we don't have to build this ship and get on it and go to virginia if we don't want to so he starts and and, and actually he's he's the the second version of this there's there's four separate mutinies or conspiracies and and what each of them these conspiracies are are, are merely to absent themselves from the virginia company's jurisdiction to, to have settlers go off to their own island in bermuda and begin their own village the reason they want to do this is because bermuda is is basically a paradise you now there's fish fowl fruit uh swine enough to eat barbecue for the rest of their lives uh, there's no reason for them to leave Bermuda. Bermuda is, is just a spectacular place, and, and they know what waits for them in Virginia. So they want to go off to their own island, start their own village, start their own community, and enter into a new contract of mutual consent. Now, that term mutual consent from the Virginia company is a bad word, you know, and they just they invoke it, saying this, this is how evil Stephen Hopkins is. He's, he's promoting this doctrine of mutual consent. Um, but of course, that's why we ought to be revering Stephen Hopkins. He's the villain of the tale from the point of view of, of the Virginia Company, but from the point of view uh, of us today, uh, you know, he, he's the first one who is voicing the very principles of democracy that are going to end up underpinning the Declaration of Independence.
And one Hopkinsite even tells the governor to kiss my arse. So yeah, exactly. tell, tell us that story about uh, that uncommon revolution. Yeah, and, yeah, this is Henry Payne. And, and this is, well, I, I guess to get to that story, I, I ought to tell the story of Stephen Hopkins' uh, rebellion. So I, I said there's four separate ones. The first one, the governor gets wind of very quickly. Uh, and he discovers that people want to, you know, what they think of as, as marooning themselves. They want to escape into the woods the, the way uh, slaves under in Spanish possessions in the New World would escape into the hinterland, into the swamps, into the mountains, and establish their own government. Uh, but the governor, get, governor gets wind of it, and he finds out who the six ringleaders are, and he actually maroons them and humiliates them. They, they're basically suffering a, a, a death penalty sentence because they're sent into the wilderness with no tools or anything. Uh, so he foils that first one. And then Stephen Hopkins is, is the second uh, revolution, if you will. And it gets discovered, of course, uh, more than half the people were part of the Stephen Hopkins revolution. He was going to lead more than half of the 151 remaining settlers. Well, I guess I'd have to take the, the sailors out of that. So about 120 were remaining, and he was going to take more than half of them out into the wilderness. But he gets discovered, and he gets hauled in chains before the entire community gathered by by the governor. And the governor tries him, convicts him, sentences him to death. And uh, Stephen Hopkins talks his way out of the death penalty. Uh, but basically, he's he's humiliated as well, and discredited. And yet, this 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 the idea that he's articulating continues on, and the disgruntlement increases as as the ship gets closer and closer to, to its completion, as people know they're going to be transported to to Virginia. So the Kiss My Arse Revolution is is started. Uh, accidentally uh, by by Henry Payne, who who is actually he's a gentleman. Uh, a couple of the gentlemen, we don't know how many, but at least some of the gentlemen had been persuaded by Stephen Hopkins' arguments, and and were part of this cabal. So even after Stephen Hopkins got got humiliated, the, the you know the idea did not die; it, it, it continued to live. And the new conspiracy was actually going to be much more dramatic. They were going to seize. Uh, the store of arms and tools, and um, you know, run off into the wilderness. But but they were gonna they were gonna have the means of their own defense. If if the governor wanted to come and try to take them back, they were gonna fight their way uh, to prevent it. So this was even a more serious rebellion than Stephen Hopkins had had suggested. And as it was as it was approaching, but before it was ready to hatch. This guy, Henry Payne, uh, just had enough. I mean, the governor caught wind of it, but what he did is he, um, he doubled the guard on, on, the, on the storehouse, and the gentlemen who were part of his, his loyal corps de guard uh, were doing double duty uh, for days and days on end. And this guy, Henry Payne, was one of those, uh, but he himself was also a co-conspirator. And he got to the point where he was just so frustrated and um, couldn't put up with it. He, he basically broke, is what you know, psychologically broke under the pressure. And his captain, you know, gave him some order to to you know, report for guard duty, and he just blew up at him and said he was he was no longer going to take orders. And then his his captain said, "Well, it, you better do it, or I'm going to tell the governor." And Henry Payne said, "The governor can kiss my arse," and that. You know, those words were potent enough uh, that, uh, you know, everybody, people heard it and they looked to see what happened. And, and he actually even struck this captain. So there, everyone is, is, is watching the developments to see, see what's going to happen. And uh, not, everything seems, seems pretty quiet overnight. And eventually, the governor hears that he has been cursed out by by Henry Payne, and and he knows that he has to do something, but he has to be very careful about it because he knows most of the people are actually in uh, in sympathy with Henry Payne rather than in sympathy with himself. So he handles it pretty delicately, but he ends up uh, arresting Henry Payne and and again trying him publicly, condemning him to death, and and um, Payne goes to the scaffold. Uh, expecting to be to be rescued expecting everyone to rise up and and 
and they don't. They don't have the courage to rise up, and he ends up getting getting executed. Uh, so this, for the rest of the settlers, the the Kiss My Arse Revolution is is kind of the death blow to their hopes of es establishing a government of mutual consent in Bermuda. And eventually, the the ship is finished. They they launch it. They rig it. And basically at gunpoint, they, the, the settlers are, are made to get on the ship and, and sail off to Virginia. So in essence, that, the, the Kiss My Arse revolution is, is the, uh, I would guess, the, the, the one act of open, open defiance that took place in, uh, in Bermuda that ends up in an execution and really proving to everybody the, the, the lethal power that the Virginia Company held over everyone. So it was the, the, the crucial, the crucial revolution. Um, and uh, the Democrats, the people who, who wanted to establish a, a government that we would describe as democracy, uh, unfortunately were defeated. Today was just part one of our interview with Professor Kelly, so be sure to check back in next week for the exciting conclusion to the saga of Stephen Hopkins. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.